I come to you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for being here on this gloomy May day. I know I am ready for the gloom to pass on by. It's time to have some nice weather. So today is our final series in our Church Is series. So this is our fifth and final Sunday where we're taking a break from the lectionary and talking about what the church is. And so let's see, we had five Sundays. So our first Sunday, we talked about how the church is a spirit-filled, diverse community that speaks multiple languages where everybody is somebody. And we talked about how the church is the body of Christ, made up of different parts that each has an important role to play. And we talked about how the church exists for people outside these walls. The church is a public good. And just last week, we talked about how the church is countercultural. We proclaim that Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. So today, we're going to talk about how the church is sent into the world to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near. Now, as Christians, and we talk about the kingdom of God a lot. We hear about it, Jesus talks about it, but what does it really mean? And we have our passage from Luke today to explore that topic together. In Luke's gospel, we, have, we read today about the sending out of the 70. And this is actually the second time that Jesus sends people out. The first time he just sent out his 12 closest disciples. But this time, Jesus sends out 70 disciples, sending out even more people because there is more good news to be preached to all corners of the earth. So what are these disciples supposed to do? Well, it's pretty simple. They're told four things. Don't take anything with them. Live with whoever will have them and eat their food. Cure the sick and say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. That's, that's pretty easy. We can all get some, that seems simple, right? And let's look at each of these aspects and see what it meant to the disciples and what it can mean to us today. So the disciples are told not to take anything with them. No purse, no bag, no sandals. And this is strange advice. So these people are going out for a journey. And Jesus tells them, basically, leave, leave your toothbrush at home and don't bring your wallet. You won't need those because God will provide for you once you get where you're going. And I don't know about you, but when I travel... I usually have a couple of changes of clothes and a hotel reservation. But Jesus is looking for something different here. And obviously these disciples lived in a different time. They, they couldn't use their smartphones to make a reservation at the closest Holiday Inn. But this is less about having a place to sleep at night and more about trusting other people to take care of you. This is about being vulnerable and trusting that others and God will step into that gap so that you, so that those disciples, will be able to preach the good news. It's also about letting go of what you think you need to be successful. I can just imagine these disciples saying, Jesus, i got to bring a bag with me so I can put my Book of Common Prayer in there. 
How am I supposed to tell people what we believe if I don't have my resources? But the thing is, what we are preaching, what we are telling, it's actually us and our lives. We live the message. And this means that although we may rely on things, it's actually about us. And I think about the things that we have here in the cathedral, namely this beautiful building. And this beautiful building is a testament to the faith of our ancestors who built this for us. But this building is not our faith. We also have an endowment, and it's nice. It's nice because it helps us to continue our ministry, helps us to maintain this building. But the number of zeros in our bank account is not what defines our ministry as being successful. These physical, tangible things are only as useful for ministry as we are. And sometimes you must leave them behind in order to reap a harvest. So the disciples are told to trust that strangers will be the ones who meet their physical needs and trust that they themselves are enough to be able to bring the kingdom of God. And we can do this today. We can start talking to everybody who shows up. We can go into our neighborhood and get to know our neighbors. We can continue our ministries with New Bethany, which brings us and our neighbors closer together. And these are ways that we can exhibit this trust that those, our neighbors will be there for us and that we are enough. No matter what our building may look like or what's in our bank account. So the disciples are told to bring nothing with them and stay with whoever offers hospitality and eat whatever is put in front of them. Again, this is a bit of strange advice. Jesus did that a lot, said things a little surprising. He, the church is countercultural. We get that from Jesus. So these disciples are going into regions where people will most likely not be Jewish. So these are people who do not follow the purity laws that require them to prepare and eat food in certain ways. So Jesus is talking to his good, loyal Jewish followers, and he is asking them to eat food that will probably not follow their purity laws. He is asking them to put aside their preconceived notions and instead accept what they are offered as a gift. And this is a precursor to the story we heard in Acts when Peter realized that all food was clean, which means that all people are clean. They are also told to stay in the house that welcomes them. And this is interesting because they are not to move once they know the area better and know the people better. You see, after a week, they may realize that they're staying with Sue, who is the worst cook in the village, and, and they could have been staying with Bobby, who is a Michelin star chef. But, but they're told not to move, not to look for better accommodations. And how this applies to us is a little harder to understand, but for us, I think it means that we are supposed to be here, where our church is built. We're not supposed to be trying to find a church that suits our needs or preaches our politics or even has the best choir, although we do have a wonderful choir. This is our church, and our church is in this community. And it means that this community is our mission field. And it might help to think about the word parish. And I know normally we just use it interchangeably with church or congregation, but that's not its original meaning. And I grew up using parish to mean something completely different. 
because I grew up in Louisiana. And in Louisiana, a parish is actually a division of the civil government. It is equivalent to a county. And, and so I grew up in East Baton Rouge Parish, and that was the group that parish ran my school board. And they provided for other people in the county, in the parish. And I think this is closer to what parish originally meant. It meant a geographic region. And so this church is responsible for all the souls in the parish, whether or not they are members of this congregation. And this means that if we start thinking about our parish as our neighborhood, as the south side of Bethlehem, or maybe even Fountain Hill, we are called to be involved in what happens here, to make sure that the people here have opportunities to flourish. And we already do that in so many ways. Our after-school program that runs in our basement from, for students from Fountain Hill Elementary. We partner with Community Action for community meetings regularly in our parish hall. Just a couple weeks ago, we had a meeting to find out about housing resources so that people who are living here can learn about how to afford and stay in their housing. And we partner with New Bethany to address the needs of the families who live just on the other side of our parking lot. We have our English classes so that the recently arrived neighbors have opportunities to get ahead and help their families. This is our parish. We do not get to move to a neighborhood that we think is more desirable. This is the house we have chosen to stay in. And so we minister here. The disciples were told to carry nothing, stay with those who welcomed them, and cure the sick. This one is especially challenging because we don't usually experience the miraculous healing that the Bible talks about. I know that many of us in this congregation have had life-altering diagnoses, or our loved ones have. And we pray that God can heal the person, just like Jesus did in the Bible. And that doesn't normally happen. Instead, we endure treatment after treatment, and learn how to live in a new reality. And sometimes our loved ones follow all the advice of the doctors, do all the treatments, and yet they go on to the glory of God much sooner than we had hoped. This is the reality of disease. Yet the disciples are called to cure the sick. What did that mean for them, and what can that possibly mean for us? For them, I think it did mean caring for those who were sick. But perhaps they cared for those who were suffering from diseases like loneliness and isolation. The CDC recently said that there is an epidemic of loneliness in this country. This is a sickness that can even a simple smile can help alleviate the symptoms. But there are also other sicknesses in our society that do all, not always manifest with bodily symptoms. There is a sickness of white supremacy in this nation. This disease has infected us since the first Europeans landed on this continent. And we are still trying to determine how to cure this disease. It has cost many people their lives and even more their dignity. We can look for cures and try to alleviate the symptoms in our parish. Many ways we can do this. By being intentional in the way that we incorporate and bring new people, especially people of color, into our community. We do this by rethinking how we tell our history. Whose images do we include in our Sunday school lessons? We can learn about the history of all the people who have lived in this country, 
not just those who came from European ancestors. And we can preach that Jesus loves all people. But Jesus is especially there with those who have been excluded and harassed and made to feel less than simply because the color of their skin. We expand our ministry to all the people of color who live in our parish. And we know that we cannot cure this disease of white supremacy quickly, for it has been festering in this country for hundreds of years. But we can begin to alleviate the symptoms. And we pray that future generations will be able to find the cure. There is also a sickness of political division in this country. This disease makes us believe that who we vote for, either Republican or Democrat, is more important than who we believe in, Jesus. This disease tells us that those who think differently than us are not capable of loving and are not capable of truly understanding the world around us. This disease makes us feel righteous at the expense of other beloved children of God. We must cure this disease. And we cure this by remembering that our first identity is as a beloved child of God, a follower of Jesus. All else is secondary to our claim that Jesus is Lord. We can cure this disease by talking openly and respectfully with people who disagree with us politically. And remember that all of us are trying our best to love Jesus and love our neighbor, even when it may seem impossible to understand how that person is doing that. And we need to find a cure. There are many people in the world who are suffering and need to be healed. The work of the disciples to, is to cure the sick, but not just those who are sick with viruses and bacteria, but also our community, which is sick and suffering from lies and division, and the effects of diseases like white supremacy and political division. And although we are called to heal, we are not called to judge. There will be some who do not want to be healed. Jesus says that we can offer our peace, and if it is rejected, that is okay. We can go to others who will accept it. It is not on us to judge those who do not accept this offer of peace. God is the one who will judge. The disciples were called to take nothing with them, to stay and eat with those who offered hospitality, cure the sick, and to say, the kingdom of God has come near to you. This final instruction is there because we must explain what we are doing. Because you see, the kingdom of God is made when we create community by eating together when we serve one another in love, when we cure the individuals and the communities that are sick. This is the kingdom of God. This kingdom is coming near because we are doing the work of the kingdom. So this church is what we are called to do. And the church is all of you. We, like the 70 that Jesus sent out, are sent to proclaim the kingdom of God is near. And we start here in our parish. We eat with those who show up. We do not focus on our material building or wealth. Instead, we trust that when we are vulnerable and needy, our needs will be met by those who we encounter. We address the needs of our parish by getting to know our neighbors. We cure the sick by remembering that Jesus is Lord and Caesar is not. All of this is proclaiming that the kingdom of God has come near in action. The words simply express what we are doing. 
The church, you and all the people who follow Jesus, are called to proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near with our words and our actions. Amen.